families here, your youth here. This is for the youth. This event is for you and for the youth. So uh, after Sunday, inshallah, we're going to set the table here, right up in the front. We're going to have our six imams. Brother Taha Qureshi will be moderating the event. Um, and it will be a question and answers session for everyone to participate. Youth, all the young youngsters, please stay. This is your opportunity to sit and interact with the imams. Also parents, the same thing. Ladies, uh, please participate in this event. It's very important. Not uh, uh, ever have we ever had in South Florida so many imams sitting on the same panel to discuss the same issue. And I'll talk a little bit more about it when we start the issue. So inshallah, after Sunday, we'll start the program. Assalamu alaikum. MashaAllah, I'm uh, very, very excited to be part of this historic event. Um, inshallah, our moderator, Taha Qureshi, will go through and give a proper introduction to all of our scholars, all of our imams. Um, but before that, I wanted to give just a brief introduction so you know why we're here and whose idea was this to come together. Uh, the South Florida Muslim Federation, alhamdulillah, uh, the number, our number one driver is to unify the community and point everybody in the same direction to work together towards the same goals. Alhamdulillah, we've made a lot of accomplishments. But tonight, we want to specifically talk about our beloved Imams. Our Imams, alhamdulillah, they, they sacrifice so much. They're our, our spiritual advisors, our marriage counselors, our business counselors, our conflict counselors. They lead prayer, they lead tarawih, uh, everything. We ask so much of them, they sacrifice so much from us, but often they are absent from the conversation. And alhamdulillah, earlier in the year, we started meeting, all of the imams started meeting, and they all, just so you know, they all unanimously agreed that the number one problem in our community is the youth leaving the deen, not practicing the deen, not identifying as Muslim, and a little more. So after multiple meetings and sitting together, the Imams actually came up with this idea. They said, let us sit together in a panel and have an interaction with the community. So we can interact with the youth. The youth can ask questions of the Imam. Um, and we're going to do this in a controlled format. But I wanted to give you the history. This is something that the Imams actually came up with. These Imams here came up with this plan and inshallah, we are having one now here, and we will have another one down south. So this is very historic. I can't remember the life of me. I do remember being this age, just like this young man, sitting right in front of Imam Hassan Sabri when I was a youth at, at Pompano. I remember that. But I never remember seeing all of the ulema, all of the scholars sitting together to interact with the community. So this is actually quite a significant accomplishment. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring barakah, to bless this, and to bless all of you for taking your time to participate in this event. So that's a brief background. Inshallah, I'm going to invite the moderator, Taha. He will be in control of the event for the rest of the evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like the uh, shield to introduce themselves. Uh, we can start on the right hand side. And what I want you to say is the, your name, obviously, uh, the masjid you are affiliated with, and your background in Islamic studies. My name is Tathi Khadri, I'm the uh, Imam of the uh, Islamic Center of Boko uh, My uh, background with the Islamic studies started when I was at a very young age, just like the uh, kids sitting here. I used to go to the uh, Masajid and attend uh, lectures. Uh, from scholars, from students of knowledge. I never thought that one day I would be speaking in front of an audience or, you know, step on a minbar and deliver a khutbah. I was very, very interested in these subjects that the Shuyuk were explaining on that day. I learned a lot from our Shuyuk and I bless them and uh, reward them for everything they did. Uh, before we move on to the next one, uh, next Imam, I would like to just remind everybody, uh, again, this is interactive, so by the time we're done with the introduction, I need question comments on uh, question cards in my hand, so that way we can begin the interaction. So if you need a, a card, just raise your hand, and one of the volunteers will come to you, inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Khushtar Murani. Khushtar is a Persian word that meaning is JJ Jinda. And Nurani is of course the Arabic word. And 
I'm from India and currently I've been working for the last three years in Al Amin Center of Florida. Uh, I'm the Imam of Al Amin Center. And uh, from the beginning, I mean, from the childhood, I'm in the same profession, like in Kulia Sharia, Islamic. First of all, I have completed my memorization of Quran and Tajweed and everything. And then I started learning Kulia uh, Sharia, Hadith and Quran, and then for higher study, I went to Libya, Tripoli, Tripoli, School of Dawa Islamia, where I have completed my lessons, my Fazila in Arabia, and then I came back to India, and then I got admission one of the most uh, popular university that is called Aliga Muslim University, where I have completed my bachelor in Islamic studies, then my master in Islamic studies, then I got the PhD in Islamic studies. And now, currently, uh, till now, I have written more than 35 books, and I'm the debater in a different various news channel in India and Pakistan. And now I am the examiner of five different university examiner of the PhD this time. So, Alhamdulillah, this way the life is going on. Jazakallah khair. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa sallam wa mattabihu bi ihsan ila yawm al-deen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It is one of the most difficult tasks that I've been given to introduce myself I personally don't like introductions, especially introducing myself. So I would be brief and mostly my introductions would be disclaimers. So disclaimer number one, I am not an Imam. And disclaimer number two is if you really want to stretch, you can call me Talib ul or student of knowledge. That title I am ready to take. And we should all be ready to take the title of Talib al -Ain. So my journey towards knowledge started when I was born. And I was born in Pakistan. And I, after my graduation in engineering, I moved to U.S. And Alhamdulillah, I went to Purdue for <laughs> masters and I learned a lot. The masjid size over there was as the, the library size of the masjid was same as the size of the masjid. So you can tell how many books or how much value they gave on knowledge. So I reinforced my my learning there. And this masjid where I'm sitting, Alhamdulillah, is a masjid which has reinforced my knowledge at least for five years. I learned aqidah, fiqh, and and tafsir of Quran also in this masjid for five years and my beloved Sheikh is here uh, today uh, accompanying me, Sheikh Ibrahim. Currently I am uh, engaged in da'wah activities across uh, South Florida, across various massages and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me the honor of doing khutbas in over 20 massages in South Florida area. I am focusing on uh, tafsir al Quran in several massages these days. Uh, my focus has changed from aqidah and fiqh on the study of and knowledge of Quran because I feel this is a forsaken or, 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 or a left out field that we are not focusing on. So, some of the massages I'm involved in Islamic Central Western, Islamic Cent uh, Masjid Mutaqim, and also the, masjid, the, the neighboring masjids in the Broward County that I'm engaged with. Last but not least, um, when the brother said about uh, the uh, youth problems, I want to make a disclaimer. Inshallah, if we could, uh, you know, get through the rest of the introductions. I already have essays in my hand, so I want to get through these. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Sultan Muhammad. Uh, I am the Imam of IFSF, Islamic Foundation of South Florida. 
my education includes um, memorization of the Quran in Canada. Thereafter, I did five years of the eight-year Alamiya program in Canada, specializing in fiqh, hadith, tafsir, aqidah, uh, adab, and all these Islamic sciences. Uh, and then I went to South Africa to complete it in a institution called Dar, um, Darul Mazalbi or Madrasa Arabiya Islamiya. And then I, I went on to do the Khassas Fil Fiqhi Wal Ifta, which is specialization in jurisprudence. Uh, throughout the Alim program, I studied all of the different uh, fiqh, but specialization was done in the Hanafi school of thought. Thereafter, um, I returned and I was the Imam of Masjid al Nur in Kendall uh, for about two years, and then I moved up to Broward in the Islamic Foundation in South Florida. So that's it. Bismillah ar rahim I'll make it very brief. My name is Hassan Sabri. I am the Imam of the Islamic Center of South Korea. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Bismillah ar rahim My name is Sheikh Ali Barakat. I am the current Imam of AICF in Pantano. I was 20 years the English speaker for Islamic Jafariya Association in Miami. I was the Imam Salat al Jum'ah University of California at Berkeley for eight years. My Islamic studies started in Lebanon under the instruction of late Ayatollah Muhammad Hussein Fadlallah. My specialty is the Quranic studies and interpretation of different tafsir. Thank you. So in the last, let's say, 10, 15, 20 years within the South Florida Muslim community, what is the change that you've noticed within the youth, amongst the youth? Um, if I have seen uh, a shift or a transition in the life and the behavior and the uh, thinking modules of our youth, it must have been after the introduction of the social media. That's when a lot of things uh, started changing uh, as, as a result of that. Even the modules of education and teaching and learning and the sources for knowledge uh, all of a sudden have changed. Interaction uh, also has uh, changed, social life, friendship, a lot of things uh, started to be defined uh, differently. Now for those who were born after the age of the social media and the internet, they would not have changed, uh, noticed any change or much change. But for those who grew up uh, prior to the internet and the social media, and then went through the changes that the uh, uh, social media has brought would have noticed uh, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of change. Before we were blaming the TV mainly, and maybe the uh, school and the uh, peer pressure uh, uh, from the peers at school and so on. Uh, now most of the problems come from the internet and from the interaction, uh, uh, free interaction if you will, between people uh, in the internet. It brought the world uh, population closer. It made the interaction between cultures also more frequent, frequent than it used to be. Now you could be talking to somebody in China or in Japan or in Europe. Uh, your kid might be talking to somebody you do not know. They don't, you don't know what ideas they are discussing, uh, what things are uh, being taught to your, uh, to your child. Now, the results, of course, are very clear. I think everybody can notice uh, changes in the shape of the family, the behavior of the family. Nowadays, you have the father and the mother and the children sitting in the same place, but each one interacting with somebody thousands of miles away and hardly having uh, interaction among, uh, among themselves. Uh, also, uh, you will notice that people are becoming, young, our young people, are becoming more into this virtual involved into this virtual world rather than the reality that they live in. Everybody has created a cocoon for themselves, their own games, their own bodies, their own uh, chatting places, their own even identity, and they are locked up uh, in that. And they do not feel the urge, you know, to look for alternatives outside the internet because the internet is a world by itself. I think the uh, uh, main changes, you know, happened uh, happened with that. I'm sure that there might be other uh, things that my colleague.
the under the community or or adults also and i've seen that the, you know sometimes the, the the kids are talking to each other it's empty messages i work in telecom i see that on an average a youth makes 5000 text messages over over less than a month and one phone call or two phone calls so the phone call the, the the person to person contact has reduced but the text messaging and the virtual messaging has, has gone super high up uh, what it has done is that bad and worse but now state by state starting from canada which is north of us state by state we are going to be showing impact so things that were not okay are not okay um, the, the discussion of lgbt and, and homosexuality was very little that is exposed to that we have started accepting those and started the conversation it may be okay however our principles have not changed and i was just talking about coming here the principle that um, Nuhman alayhi salam gave to his son Dhamma Nabi Akhim Salah Bakhmur bin Maruf and Ali Muntah Waspir Allah Maha Sahabak Aina Dhalika Min Azmin Uhur He gave very simple advice Oh my son, establish Salah, order good for you But he, and those are still applicable The acceptability of the problem is changing So the parents mentality and society is also changing at the same time Which is a big challenge How do we adjust, how do we adhere to the same principles and come up with the, the modern solutions or the new solutions to address this problem. The community of the masjid has to be, uh, uh, the kids should be able to reach it. So his email, his phone, uh, phone number should be available to, to the youth. And this is something I, I, I've made sure that, for instance, when our youth graduate from GSA, I made sure that I give them my phone number I give them my email address, and believe me, I receive uh, text messages from our graduates, I receive emails, and uh, both sides, boys and girls. And uh, when they move to the college, they have a lot of questions. They face, you know, uh, the, uh, the girls become women, you know, they ask questions about certain things that they can do, they cannot do. Uh, then they ask also questions about evolution, about you know calling others to Islam and they have other issues like where he gives his you know email address, his phone number and he can chat with the with the youth and he can answer the questions. So one thing that was told to me before I was assigned my post as Imam of the Islamic Foundation of South Florida was that, hey, you're young, you are the youth, and you are an Imam, so you got one foot in there and one foot in here, so you know what, as soon as you come in, youth can talk your language, youth can relate to you, everything is, is going to be well and dandy, and as soon as you get there, youth are going to flock into the masjid. I mean, the love factor is there, yes, they do relate to me on a different level than they would relate to an elderly Imam, but it's not that magical. You know what I'm saying? Like when it comes to relatability and approachability, there still is a little bit of a barrier of, of the masjid. Just, you know, uh, the, the whole sanctity, it just kind of, it's kind of like overwhelming for the youth. So what I have done, the question was, what have we as Imams done to reach out to them or to talk to them in their language? Um, one thing that I started and I saw was very, very beautiful and, uh, and effective was a lot of times younger folks, especially you know college going folks, are not really going to come to the masjid besides a Jum'ah or besides a prayer or two that parents bring them with. And college students are usually there, they're studying, and every time they come home, it's for a limited amount of time. And that's the dynamic of our community, with the youth of our community. So what I thought to do was, why not go to them in their environment? So I have dedicated my Wednesdays as kind of like part of my job to go to them at their university. So I go one Wednesday to the Florida International University, FIU, and then one week to NOVA. Um, and then I, I speak to them over there. And then because of the fact that there's no other adults around, there's, there's just a comfort zone. And me, I'm reaching out to them as one of them. 
I get a lot of questions, I get a lot of concerns, a lot of things, a lot of times. Just last Wednesday, you know, a young lady said, I never asked this question to anyone before, and before she even asked a question, she held it in for so long, she couldn't hold it any longer, and she started bawling, she started crying, right? Because she's like, I never had the chance or the environment to ask this question. So that's one thing that I've done, and uh, Alhamdulillah, may Allah accept it, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow it to evolve, but yeah, I saw it was very, very effective, but it's one step in the right direction amongst many that can be taken also. Thank you, I'll be very brief. Well, the issue is very challenging dealing with the youth. I personally gave up on the adults, so I'm investing my time with the youth. Uh, especially the youth, the females. I think from my humble experience, there has to be an interaction about the social media with the youth. And this interaction has to be face-to-face. -face, plus conference to the internet. Unfortunately, Last 15 years, a lot of youth are going to the Imam, Google. Google Imam. If I can say that. But as you know, Google is an ocean of information and it's a mixture of truth and falsehood. And besides, we have a problem in dealing with the social media by itself. It's becoming very addicting to a lot of youth. So what we do is we make sure that we direct the time and the energy that the youth have with the social media to benefit from the social media itself. I personally as an imam, whether I'm an imam or a young man or a young woman, I could benefit from the social media. I have on the internet 67,000 books accessible to me. This is great. But also, it's a dangerous highway. So in order to save the youth from falling into the trap of addiction and going into issues that are totally un-Islamic and losing them, I think we should keep communicating with them in Al-Masajid by delegating such certain responsibilities to them to come and talk to us about it. Whatever concern they have, the concern that the youth have, assimilation, problem of identity, peer pressure, addiction, bicultural issues, different school of thoughts, different interpretation. I think if we dedicate to them to raise the discussion with us in Al-Masajid, they will come and once they benefit, I think they will be consistent in coming. Thank you. Three years I've been here and I've been watching continuously uh, that uh, the number of prisons is very low, especially I'm talking about the youth, and it's very difficult to reach them. So I tried uh, before, like uh, especially during the month of Ramadan, I, I saw for the last three Ramadan that a lot of youth came in the Ramadan, so I tried to contact with them personally. I took their email IDs and, and phone number and tried to reach out. And then, uh, alhamdulillah for them, when I came uh, in the Lamin centers, I found there was uh, no as such uh, the means or activities for there. So first of all, like the, the, the youths love to play in, in the Masadi. And we do not have uh, uh, such means in the Masjid. So, the next years I uh, did fundraising for especially for the playground and, and I started many things to attract the youth. Like first of all I started the sports day for the youth. So Alhamdulillah for the last two years it, it, it's been very successful and the turnout was remarkable. Like a hundred of the youth and, and the kids and the family started coming. Like uh, uh, the second I started you know the organizing uh, many tournament and beside of this this is actually you can say that the attraction once they start coming then we start talking to them and they run. once they have been familiar with the atmosphere then uh, they are more comfortable to you know raise their questions and they feel that imam is not an alien person that to whom if i talk 
so maybe he shouts or maybe he something like that, he raises his voices. But Alhamdulillah, then later on, I feel that uh, I mean, dozens of uh, youth, uh, they've been very comfortable now, and they, whenever they have any, any problem, they come to me. And, but before doing anything, I mean, di directly reach out, uh, I think it's my opinion that first of all, we have to create the atmosphere to be more comfortable, to give them that space in the Masajid or the Islamic Center, and definitely then, you can this way you can reach out to them. Um, so one of the things that many of you have already touched upon is the identity of Muslim. Right? Uh, Muslim is kind of a label that they try to stay away from. They don't understand the deen. So one of the youth group leaders from the community actually asked, how do you spiritually guide those who have doubts as a youth leader? So this is one youth trying to help another. And I actually, uh, to uh, elaborate a little on this situation, um, personally, I've graduated from two of the Islamic schools in South Florida. One of my classmates that graduated with me when we were in college talked to me and he said, Taha, you know, I'm considering atheism. And I, my heart, I was like, dude, we went to Islamic school together, like, what do you mean? And he said, some of the things in Islam just aren't making sense to me. So, and I, I'm, sure, I'm sure we all know that, it, like, the, the rise of atheism isn't something that's, you know, um, special or unique to the Muslim community. It's something that all faiths are facing. But how do we as a Muslim community address that rising concern? Jeff, All right, we have to understand a few things here. Uh, the responsibility of protecting the youth or protecting the uh, young generation, it's divided into two parts. You have the, uh, the family and you have the state, basically, to help in that. The state provides, for example, uh, schools. Uh, if it's a Muslim state, it provides masajids, uh, recreation centers. It protects uh, the, 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 the population from, like, uh, such as, you know, whether it's by taking a relief, whatever it is. So those Muslim organizations, they come together and they work into protecting the uh, and work together to uh, help the Muslims uh, uh, protect their team and protect their identity. Now, some events uh, outside the state, I ask them, I say, what is the, the biggest challenge that you face with the youth? They say two things. I think I want to show it. Alright, so this is an issue. Alright, how do we solve this issue? I've dealt with this issue and I've dealt with at least 20 cases like you research. Kids who graduated from Islamic schools, in fact, kids who memorize the Quran, but then they have doubts about the last and they have doubts about the principles of Islamic Aqidah. The principles of Islamic Aqidah talking. <clears throat> I had one time a father crying in front of his son and uh, He's devastated that his son told him that he's not Muslim anymore. And his son also graduated from Islamic school. Brother, this problem starts at home, number one. Starts at home. Whenever I see this situation, I ask the father, I tell him, please tell me honestly, how are you at home? How is the family at home? And you know what? 99% of the answers, we have, we have problems. That's number one. That's a reaction, more of a conviction. Something I don't know about it. Go ahead. He wouldn't tell me anything. So I started to tell him, who is Jesus? He's going to tell him that you know, he's a mighty messenger, messenger he made uh, birds from clay and he goes into them by the way of hydrogen and they become birds. I said, Is that in your Bible? He says, No. I said, Okay, let me tell you about his mind. Whenever they hear the son or the daughter asking questions about this, they will police him on that. No, you let him talk. If he asks you a question about the principles of the Akita, listen to them. If you can't answer it, bring them to someone who can answer it. Don't stop them. And I have parents who tell me the moment his child or his young daughter or young uh, son says, I'm not it's okay. I'm not going to say it's okay, it's fine. But keep, keep your relationship with them. Don't carry off. Don't carry off. Don't. Stay in contact with them. And I've seen it happen, and I've seen it succeed. 
parents told me I'm gonna cut him off, I don't want to I said no, keep talking to them. I I that there was a situation where the girl had the family and she got married and she I said keep in, keep in touch with her. Stay in touch with her. And handle that now her husband became a Muslim and she has a Muslim husband. And one day inshallah I said Allah will bring her back. But make sure you at home you're doing the right thing. Sorry if I don't know. This is the dangerous age for me. I want to be frank with you. Since we came here about it, not only our evaluation. I want to be frank with you and I want to declare a state of emergency regarding this issue. To face this issue, we cannot hide beyond our finger and we cannot put our head in the sand. If we do not address the challenge logically, academically, it doesn't matter what parents are. Prove to me that God exists. Some fathers, boom! You don't know where the heck is coming from. But to me, that's a legitimate question. You go to school and they ask you questions. And there are answers for every question. I think to address this issue, we need to look at what Judaism tells you, that's what the Zeraneshtis tells you, that's what the Hare Krishna tells you, and what's so happy. But our deen, and if you focus on the Quran, there is logic in our deen. There is a proof in our deen. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used that method to bring it. قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the others, Give me the proof of your truthful. Since we are thinking that we are truthful, we have the proof. We should have the proof. If we lack to say the proof, we need to teach ourselves how, what, and in what fashion to convince the youth when he asks us that question. And we, we should use the Quran. Burn me with your permission two minutes. With your permission, it's a very important question. In our Quran, in our Quran, there is what we call first introduction, logical introduction, and common logical conclusion. The pyramid of knowledge in the West is based on two thoughts. Two thoughts. Yeah, you want to prove theories based on two approaches. Conductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. Simply. You say, in the experimental science, I brought 60 pieces of iron, right? You did not go and see every single piece of iron in the world and you expose it to fire. Sufficient enough what you have done, you come to the conclusion. There is another form of knowledge, and it's a logical one. And it's an upper hand, and we should use it, and we should learn it ourselves in order to teach it. Because Fatih will say, I agree, if you have nothing to give, you cannot answer. I am, you say, every human is going to what? To die. You say, every human is going to die. Logical introduction. You don't need to prove this, right? Shaykh Ali Barakat is a human. Anybody can tell me. Shaykh Ali Barakat is going to what? He's going to die. The style in Al-Quran is like that. When it comes to faith in Al-Quran, Allah is asking the question. We need to discuss with the use these questions. When somebody was walking in Japan, there was this hurricane and volcano, and there was this storm, and all the steam went up in the air, and all of a sudden, the best Lamborghini landed on the ground. Is he going to believe it? Is he going to accept it? Why? Logically, he's not going to accept it. So you ask the youth, how did you exist? What is this coordination in the universe? What are the chances that it's created? What does Allah say? Qul, tell them, ya Muhammad, tell them, yuhyiha alladhi ansha'aha awwala marratin wa huwa bi kulli khalqin alim. That is a logical answer from a logical question. So when I suggest 
to combat, to combat, combat, and to stand and to oppose this notion of being an atheist, to me is not to make him memorize the Quran. A lot of people, they memorize the Quran, they become parrots, they don't know what it means. They don't know the logic behind it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in Al-Ayat, even the people who will go to Jahannam, they will go because they don't what? Let's not stick to the old school of thought, oh, don't speak about logic, don't speak about 1 plus 1 equal to A, equal B, B equal C, therefore A equal C. This is the way that you're saying, right? Now, one of the things that both of you had in common that you said was it starts in the home, right? It starts with the parents, right? And that's something I think everybody here can agree on. What are we doing to teach the parents how to parent their children? Correction, I did say it should start with the parents. These questions, they believe without any discussion. But I'm talking about the youth, second generation, third generation, American here, let's face it, they will ask the question. It is the responsibility of that imam to teach. Two on that. 30 seconds, and we'll start from Chef Ali, all the way. <laughs> 30 seconds, on the call. You asked for the impossible. <laughs> I think we should establish youth club and we should address the and briefly speaking the issues that we need to address is as I said assimilation, problem of identity, biculturalism, uh, addiction, addiction and speaking their mind, ethical issues and logical uh, question to their opinion. 30 seconds. So, you asked me what I'm going to do, so inshallah I'll try to make myself a little more available because as Imams, because we are a little overwhelmed with you know concerns from every dimension, every demographic of the community, uh, we kind of tend to make ourselves a little you know behind the scenes type of individual. I'm going to try to make myself a little more. Well, one thing that I, uh, one fact, there's 36 questions here. And I can't pinpoint, but I know there's a lot of community members from different communities, not just ICDR here. I know from traveling. But I can tell you that Imams, and I open with this a little bit, and I hear a lot of the same theme that you were going to make yourself more available for your, for your congregations and your youth. So these questions, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm looking at all of you, um, they could have asked you. And it took this event for us to bring six of our, our imams, our scholars, our people that we rely on the backbone of our deen to have them ask you, right? So one thing I do is I always look internally, what can I do better? But I hear a lot of what, what you guys are saying that you're gonna start interacting more, start making yourself more available. The same thing for all of our uh, members of our community, Alhamdulillah. We have to understand the great pressure that the imams have. I can tell you, growing up and seeing what the Imams go through, their sacrifices, their, their, their no family time, everything that they do, and I also see now being in the position of community leadership, the lack of respect and the, the, the two way that we do for the Imams. So inshallah, I ask all of you inshallah to please interact with the Imams a little more. Give them a little more attention, give them a little more respect, a little more 